Vegas, good evening to you. It is Tuesday night at 7 o'clock on the East Coast, 4 o'clock on the West Coast, 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock at various places in between. I am Jamie Beckett, the ambassador in Florida for AOPA Foundation. That guy over there is Pat Brown, who does the exact same job in Texas, just bigger and better because he's just a cooler dude. How are you doing, Jamie? I'm good, Pat. I'm real good. Thank you. I was about to tell the folks, normally we would have the, the triumvirate would be here. We would have Kay Sundrum. Uh, on the upside, Kay is not with us tonight because she is having a pool put in at her home. Very exciting. Unfortunately, it's in the living room and the water is coming from the second floor. So our hearts go out to Kay, although, you know, I suppose uh, this could just be some new kind of Southern California architecture. Who knows? That's exactly it's what it is because you know how they are out there. Well, in the background, we have our good friend, Philip Johnson, keeping all the little rodents running around on their pinwheels, making sure the electricity flows. As always, he is in the hardened bunker at the base of Mount Rushmore, not operating the gift shop this time. I believe he has turned that over to somebody else, probably an intern of some sort. But the important thing is Pat's here, and I'm here, and we're going to talk about transition training. It doesn't really matter if you're going uphill to bigger, more complex aircraft or downhill to smaller, less capable aircraft. You need to do transition training. Pat, I'm sorry that intro was so long, but it's darn good to see you. How's life in Texas this evening? Everything is just terrific. We had a little bit of rain this afternoon, but it has stopped. It's, uh, it has cooled down to a, a balmy 97 and uh, very comfortable outside. Uh, Let's see, how's everything down there in the uh, in the uh, hurricane magnet that sticks out there in the Gulf? Well, we did have one just a couple weeks ago, as you may recall. It was all Ooh. kinds of exciting. Lots of rain, not a whole lot of wind. But uh, yeah. just being Florida, you know, by law, it's got to be an enjoyable afternoon. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a local ordinance, but it's generally adopted throughout the state. And um, I'm still glowing because, you know, speaking about transition training, I got to do a little piece for AOPA Live recently where I flew an Icon A5 out at Jack Brown Seaplane Base. I'm, you know, I appreciate the condolences, Pat. It is a brutal burden I have to bear going down to the seaplane base, flying Icon A5s around Central Florida, splashing around in lakes. You know, you really shouldn't have to do this sort of thing, but I'm willing to take the hit. You know, I understand, and, and it's a magnanimous gesture on your part, uh, Jamie. I, I, you, you don't know how, how, how much I appreciate you sparing the burden from the rest of us. <laughs> well, it's a heavy burden, Pat, but I'm going to carry it around. <laughs> By the way, I neglected to mention, as I almost always do, Pat and I are going to talk about transition training tonight, but we're open to whatever you've got. Any kind of aeronautical question you've got, just throw it our way. We'll do everything we can to answer it. And if we don't get to it because of the volume of questions, shoot us an email address or send us an email. That's pat.brown at aopa.org. I'm yeah. jamie.beckett at aopa.org. It's right there on the screen. And we really will write you back because we're just that lonely. And you, so, <laughs> and you know something, too, uh, just, just as, uh, you know, right on to piggyback on that. Uh, you know, we're going to be doing a special edition of this uh, come, uh, come Oshkosh time. And uh, yeah, right so, around the corner. Yeah. So uh, if we don't get to anything tonight uh, from any anybody out there, uh, just uh, we, we may address that in a special edition of uh, the Oshkosh uh, thing. And wouldn't it be nice to be part of a special edition? That's like yeah. a limited release album on colored vinyl. That's that you, <laughs> you just got to enjoy that sort of thing. And I think that's a reference only for people in our age bracket. Oh, yeah. You're dating yourself there. I barely remember it. Well, let's get into this transition training thing. You know, Pat, I started flying in a Cherokee 161 right. and then switched to a 172 and soloed and then went on and finished up my training in a 152, all very different airplanes. And it, you would think, well, they're all entry-level beginner airplanes, but you really can't just go from one to the other like it's no big deal, can you? No, you know, you talk about those three airplanes in particular, one has a 110 horsepower engine and is anemic at best. Uh, the other one, uh, the other high wing airplane has 150 or 160 horsepower engine, a little bit roomier, a little faster, 
uh, gets off the ground a little bit quicker. Uh, the third one that you mentioned is a low-wing airplane. Uh, and I can't wait to see all the comments about what's better, a high-wing airplane or a low-wing airplane. That's what's coming next, I can guarantee yep, it. Yeah, you know it is. Uh, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is that depending on the, on the model of, of Cherokee we're flying, you either had a push-pull yoke or you had a, a throttle quadrant style yoke with a T-handle on it. Mm -hmm. And as little as that may sound like it ought to be a, uh, not to be a difference, or as much as that sounds like there ought to not to be a difference there, there is a muscle memory thing when you're going from this kind of emotion to this kind of emotion. It's different. It sure is. And and even going from a low wing to a high wing, the Cessnas being a gravity feed fuel system, you can put the fuel selector on both. That really doesn't work on the low wing. So you have to start learning how to set a timer and switch that tank and, and do it the proper way. You know, turn the electric fuel pump on, switch yeah. the tank, turn the pump off and make sure you've still got fuel flow. None of this is just automatic. So I, I guess the advice I might want to give, if I was the kind of guy who gave advice, yeah. if you're switching from any type of airplane to any other type of airplane, it's really a good idea to go get some instruction in that type of airplane because it is going to be a different world. And we've got a great uh, comment here from Jonathan G. Good evening, Jamie and Pat. Good evening. Right back to you, Jonathan. I'm so glad this is the topic tonight. Greetings from Florida. See, we all had a meeting together, Pat. We're going to, the Floridians are here. You're going to gang you up fly, on the Texans. <laughs> you fly tail dragger aircraft, Pat. And I, I got my tail dragger rating at one point. Uh, still fly them. Yeah. Absolutely amazed. It was a shock to me how dramatically different a tail dragger is from an equivalent and similar tricycle gear airplane. What was the thing that you think maybe caught your attention when you first tried it? Cause I've got to admit, I've got to imagine we all have that experience going, Whoa, that's different. Yeah. I, I think the, the one thing that, 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 well, two things really, one is the visibility over the cowling. Uh, although in the, uh, the Centabrias and the, uh, the Cathlons, which are the ones I have the most experience in, um, isn't a, a big issue. Uh, I have flown some tail draggers that uh, where it's, it's actually quite difficult to see over the over the, the cowling. So yeah. there's that. You have to kind of do S turns. And you know, they think you're drunk. You're taxiing down because you're doing S turns around the center line. But uh, uh, the, the the tendency of those things to want to swap ends and go down the runway tail wheel first. Uh, it can be a, a little bit of a revelation the first time it starts to, to, to wiggle on you a little bit if you, if you don't get on it quick enough. So those, those are the big ones. The other thing is just the stick, the stick versus the oak. We could talk about that at some point. Too. Yeah. Well, you know, that was an interesting thing for me, you know, that stick versus yoke. But also the fact that in a tricycle gear airplane, you can get very lazy on the controls where you're taxiing around. That's because it true. really doesn't feel like it matters much. And in a tail yeah. dragger, especially a, a light one, uh, a Cub, a Champ, a T-Craft, man, five or six knots of wind will move you around. The thing I learned, and, and I'd be curious if you learned the same thing or something different, when you're taxiing, climb into the wind, dive away from it. That allows exactly you to have right. the right inputs all the time because it's the elevator, the ailerons, and you're steering with the rudders. What was your experience? Because we, yeah. I think we've all had that experience where we got lazy for a minute, and as you say, all of a sudden the tail started coming right on by. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's I, fortunately I've never actually ground looped one. I've come close. Uh, in, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you, I was checking a guy out, and I was in the back seat. He, this was in a Legend Cub, so you can solo that from the front yep. seat, and he wanted to fly it from the front seat. I don't blame him. It's it's easier. So I was in the back seat, and this particular Legend Cub has heel brakes. And I, I'll, I'll just tell you this: I hate, hate heel brakes. But that's just my. There needs to be opinion. a support group because they're awful. Oh, I hate heel brakes. Well, anyway, so we're we we, we take off from a, a a paved runway, West Houston Airport, as a matter of fact. You've taken off out of there. Oh yeah. And we we went to a, a grass field because tailwheel airplanes are born to be flown off of grass. And we went to a grass field and we must have done 15, 20 takeoffs and landings at this grass field. And this guy had it down. And of course, when you're on grass, it's a little draggier than pavement. And it's a little easier to, to frankly, to control the airplane on grass than it is on pavement. So 
I committed one of those cardinal sins uh, of any pilot, uh, a flight instructor or not, but any pilot of getting a little complacent on the way home because this guy hit, he was on it as an airline pilot. So he, I mean, he's not like he was lacking in, you know, some flying skills. So I'm getting a little complacent on the way home and we line up to a final at West Houston airport landing on runway one five. And he puts it down in what was just a near perfect wheel landing. You could hardly feel us touch down. And then he brought the stick back and the tail comes down and then it starts doing like this. And, and I can't stop it at this point. And I can't get my feet on the heel brakes fast enough to, to counteract it. And we made a hard right, never ground loop. We made a hard right heading right for some taxiway and runway lights, a cluster oh. of them all right where there was a taxiway turnoff right there. Uh, there's a cluster of them. And we went right over the top of all of them and didn't hit one. Wow. You got lucky. <laughs> we got we got real lucky. So on the other on the other side of it, uh we we, we were now we were on the taxiway, not intentionally, but we were on the taxiway. And we just sat there for a couple of seconds, like, what the heck happened? And did we damage anything? And nope, sure not. <laughs> it's the crazy well, I gotta admit, my favorite tailwheel landing experience was I, I bought, as you know, I bought a cub, 1940 J3 cub. Yeah. So I can get my tail dragger sign off. I have a real good friend, Dennis, who was teaching me how to fly. Dennis is a retired Piedmont captain, really, really adept, flew T6s for Warbird Adventures on the side. I mean, he owned a bunch of airplanes. And, I mean, he's just really good and a phenomenal instructor. And we went up and spun it, and, you know, he, he, we just did a great thing. Yeah. But one of the landings I did was not ideal. Actually, a few of them weren't, but one in particular really wasn't good. It kind of whomped down pretty hard and yeah. had a pretty good wobble to it and got it under control and straightened it out. And I'm in the back seat. Of course, you, you fly from the back. I said, I'm sorry about that landing, Dennis. It wasn't very good. And he throws up his hands and goes, not my airplane. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> so I truly love that. It de-stressed the whole moment. But no, of course, of course. I remember the, the very first uh, when, when I decided I want, uh, well, first of all, I was looking for a way to build some time. And I thought, you know, if I get my tailwheel endorsement, I could go fly uh, tail, uh, go fly tow planes for the, one of the local glider clubs. And they fly. And you did that for a while, right? I, I, I got 2,300 toes under my belt. So, oh, wow. uh, yeah. So I did it for quite a while. Well, the glider club at the time had a Pawnee and an Ag Wagon. And uh, these are single seat airplanes, by the way. So mm -hmm. there is no transition training in an airplane <laughs> like that. But I remember when I when I got my tailwheel endorsement, one of the uh, uh, I had an incredibly incredible tailwheel instructor. Her name is Joy Bowden, and she's uh, she she is just, still teaches. She's just amazing, and she taught me. Let's go ahead and we'll add a little bit of power. We'll go going rolling down the runway here. We'll raise the tail and we'll just we'll just practice balancing the airplane on the mains. And uh, we'll do kind of that, you know, we work in the rudders to keep the airplane going down and we'll do that. And and we did that a half a dozen times or better. And every time increasing our speed just a little bit more until I got more and more comfortable. And finally, she said full throttle and we took off. This was about a 30 or 40 minute exercise back and forth, just taxiing back and forth to the to the threshold runway. So I thought, well, that was that was a logical way to to get my chops down in a tailwheel airplane. I'm going to do the same thing in the Pawnee. So now the difference in the Satabria was it had a 150 horsepower engine. The Satabria, the, the, the uh, uh, Pawnee had a 230 horsepower engine. And it also had a cowling that, that from the windshield was probably a good six feet from the windscreen to the, to the propeller spinner. So it's, a, it's big. And, and I remember sitting in there and, and thinking, what in the heck have I gotten myself into? I'll never be able to master this airplane. And there's no instructor to help me. Uh, but I thought I'm going to do just what Joy did. I'm going to start up and down this grass strip and I'm just going to, you know, keep the tail down the first time and maybe raise it the second time. And I'm just going to gradually, gradually work myself up. So except that I didn't realize that how quickly the airplane will fly. And uh, we went I went flying like the second pass down the runway. 
and, and I wasn't ready for it. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm committed now. Full throttle. <laughs> Off we go. So, so well, while I'm up here, I might as well do some stalls and some steep turns and some slow flight and things like that. And really what it was was, was uh, uh, delaying the inevitable that at some point I'm going to have to come back to the land. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, 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 was, uh, it was kind of a matter of, okay, look, you have a tailwind endorsement. They really wouldn't have turned you loose with that if they didn't think that you were capable of doing it. So just keep your mind, keep your you know, keep your focus, and remember that these things are to control the airplane and not just foot rests. And um, and and landed without incident. And um, and after that, it was just fine. But um, you know, our listeners may be um, they may be faced at some point with jumping in an airplane that, that they, that they haven't flown before. And there, there may not be a, the ability to have some sort of a, of a, of a checkout with a CFI on board. So how you, how you approach that in a methodical way can be the difference between success and, and well, not success, let's put it that way. No, but I like, you make a good point. You can do things incrementally good example being a single seat airplane where you can't get instruction yeah. you can read the poh you can really understand the airplane you could go get experience in another type of airplane with similar horsepower and yes. incrementally you know taxi faster faster down the runway until you really feel comfortable and take it in the air but that kind of opens the door to something i wanted to talk to you about yeah just the upgrade in horsepower is enough to get a checkout and and learn the airplane and a good example is 172 to a 182, very popular general aviation airplanes. It could just as easily be a PA-28-161 going to a PA-28-235. All of a sudden, you're going from 160 horsepower to 235 horsepower. That's an almost 50% jump in horsepower with not a 50% jump in weight. That's exactly that right. That really can startle you, can it? When you, when you not only taken off when you pour the coals to it and it starts to accelerate much more quickly than you thought with much more left turning tendency than you've experienced before. It's true. But also coming back into the pattern, you've got to slow that airplane down. It's no longer just a matter of pulling the throttle back a bit. It really doesn't want to slow down. It takes some forethought. And what you've undoubtedly been through that and we flew the Cirrus together. Yes. Um, same thing. That's a lot of horsepower. Yes. It's going to go. Well, the other thing, too, is that in the examples that you gave a PA-28-181, let's say, versus a PA-28-235, so an Archer versus a Dakota, for example, or something like that, or a 172 versus 182, the, those larger airplanes have constant speed props. They're also considered high-performance aircraft because they're over 200 horsepower. So now you need an endorsement, not just a checkout, but an endorsement right. to fly that. Uh, oh, Martin. Martin, how are you? Martin Kastenbaum says, timely discussion looking to transition from an Archer to a Saratoga. Uh, Martin is a member of the U.S. Flight Club at uh, Houston Executive Airport. They fly Archers and Saratogas. And there's a, well, there's a great example. question because it falls right into what we're exactly talking about. They're it very does. similar airframes just on a, a cursory glance, but that's very different horsepower and complexity. Yeah, you're talking those Saratogas have, if I'm not mistaken, a 300 horsepower engine, if that's the version that they have, a constant speed prop. Um, it's, uh, um, it's got six seats. Um, so it's heavier, so it's going to be a... a I don't know exactly what the gross weight is on it, but I imagine it's about 3,200 pounds versus the Archer, which is what, 20, 26, 20, no, the Archer is about 20, 2,600 gross or something like that. So it's considerably heavier and he's made a note here, TC, so it's turbocharged as well. So you have all oh, of wow. those things to consider. Um, and, and, and while, honestly, while the speeds are, are, are similar, uh, in terms of uh, in the pattern and final approach and whatnot, those airplanes feel in uh, tremendously different uh, because of that long snout on the Saratoga. Uh, you're going to have yeah. to be darn sure to get a, enough pitch up so that you don't hit the nose wheel first. Yeah, you know, and that's a really good point. You mentioned with tail draggers very often when you talk about the visibility, it's the lack of visibility on the ground. Many of them, especially if you're, we're both of a reasonable height, but if you're, you know, five, four, five, three, something like that, you may not be able to see over the nose at all. Yeah. Also, when you get into airplanes with larger horsepower, larger mass, more inertia, they feel different in the air. The controls can be significantly heavier. 
you really can get yourself behind the airplane and have a hard time catching up if you have never had any specialized training in that aircraft. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, probably the most uh, obvious um, example of that that I think most people could relate to would be the control pressures, in particular on the ground, to be quite honest, between a 172 and a 182. Um, the, yeah. the, that, that elevator on the ground, that elevator is heavy. And uh, the, those people that get in 182s the, for, for the first time are really astounded at just how heavy that can be. Um, and I tell yeah, them, I said, when, 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 go ahead. When, when I teach people to land a 182, when I teach them to fly a 182, we really spend a lot of time going over landing. And I, I really do tell them, you got to be on the numbers, but you got to try hard not to land. And if that yoke hasn't hit the stop yet, you're not done. Because if right. you relax, you'll land on the nose wheel and buckle the firewall. It can be a really unpleasant day. you yeah. got to keep working it all the way until it's done flying. <laughs> but, you know, that's, I mean, that really is true with virtually any airplane that's out there, you know. And, and I'm not talking, I mean, there are some airplanes that, that you, you kind of fly onto the runway Bonanzas, Cirruses, and some of those bigger, heavier airplanes that you kind of fly onto the runway. But if you're talking about your typical trainer, your 172, 182, uh, uh, you know, any of the, the Piper products like that, it, you're right. If you don't have that yoke virtually, virtually back to the stops, by the time you touch down, you're going too fast. Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah. and, the, and that, those are good examples, but... You know, you, you talked about a tow plane, and we've talked about going from a 172 to 182 and a variety of things. What about going from the same airplane on wheels to the same type of airplane on floats? Oh, boy. I mean, we've both got seaplane rating, and I absolutely love flying seaplanes. It, it's a Fly, lot of fun. It? Yeah. But it doesn't matter what it is. You add floats to it. You added a lot of drag. It lowered the center of gravity significantly. Right. And now you are, if it's on floats, not a monohull, you are much higher up the surface when you're on the ground. The whole sight picture changes, power settings change. Everything's different because you went from wheels to floats, not to mention no brakes. Yeah, that, that's true. And, you know, I, I was looking at my logbook the other day, and I'm pushing close to 1,000 hours of tailwheel time. But when you, when you put, uh, and, and a bunch of that's in the Super Cub, but in, in the last a float plane I flew was a Super Cub on amphibs. Well, on the uh, because it's on amphibs, and now it's a retractable gear airplane. Mm -hmm. So, and so you know, if you're not, you know, you get into a into a Super Cub or any tailwheel airplane, typically speaking, those are not retracts. So now you get you, you get to the point where okay, this is this is a land airplane. I'm raising the gear in a tailwheel airplane, which in itself seems kind of weird. And now the gear is up, and you got to remember you got to leave it up for for a water landing. And you're right, it's it's you're, it's a higher picture, but it's also you're sitting flat on that mm -hmm. airplane that normally sits like this when it's on the ground on you know without floats. And and boy, I'll tell you what, sometimes that uh, that muscle memory you just have to suppress that muscle memory or or that mental picture that you're expecting to see. And when you're landing it on on land. Now you have to say, okay, this is a land plane and put the gear yep. down and make sure you've got four lights for each gear, one for each gear. And uh, when it lands, it handles like a shopping cart. So imagine. Yeah, that's um, a really great way to put it. It does. It, it mm -hmm. handles like a shopping cart. Yeah. And, and, and you're, you're right on water. There's no brakes. Yeah. And you often have to steer when you have gear down on, on an amphib plane. You often have to steer with the brakes yeah. because rudder's not doing anything for you in that case by the way daffy david's got an interesting point here um we we often get advice from older more experienced pilots sometimes it's good sometimes it's not he's saying full stall all landings it's advice he got from a world war ii p-51 pilot, fighter pilot back in 76 the year mm -hmm. i graduated high school by the way <laughs> uh, herbert spencer spence and god bless his soul and you know i i certainly don't want to disagree with herbert but that's true of a tail dragger Certainly, unless you're doing a wheel landing, you do want to do a full stall. In a seaplane, you do not want to do a full stall. And there are some tricycle gear airplanes, as you were talking about, you really want to fly it on. You don't want to stall it. So you can't really take many rules, at least in my opinion, Pat, 
there's not too many rules of thumb that you can just apply to all aircraft. Would you agree or? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's dangerous. It can't, it can't, I don't want to make a blanket statement because we're just talking about not making blanket statements. So it, <laughs> it, it can be dangerous to attribute one particular technique to all airplanes as a, as, as a blanket um, belief, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I personally, I like to do wheel landings in tailwheel airplanes, regardless of what the wind conditions are. There will be people that will excoriate me for that. Uh, but I personally think, in this is just my opinion, that it takes us a, a little higher level of skill to do a really good wheel landing. It's yeah. a much more of a finesse maneuver. And I well, like to think you have yes. to get that technique down yeah. with adding in the right amount of power, holding it up, but not dumping it over. Yeah. yeah. And, and, there, and there's another thing you talk about technique. I don't, I don't add power when I'm doing a wheel landing. Really? Nope. Don't need it. And I honed that skill flying those uh, tow planes, the Pawnees and the Ag Wagons, um, carrying extra Thank power. You. Carrying extra power just means you're going further down the runway and we had a limited amount of runway. And if I carried extra power, I had to get on the brakes too, too hard. So I just stopped carrying extra power and just transla transitioned or translated that particular technique into the tailwheel airplanes that I've flown. And I don't, because remember this, a wheel landing really by definition means that you're landing on the mains and not a three point, right? Right, well, right. Matter, you have that the, it, it doesn't matter whether the tailwheel is that far off the runway for that far off the runway, it's yeah. it's a wheel landing. So I, my pitch is my pitch attitude is somewhere in between a three point and a real flat pitch. But as soon as those wheels touch touch the 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 pavement, that stick goes that stick goes forward and nails it down. So, but that said, when I'm flying uh, when I'm flying my Comanche. Um, I, I make a, a, an absolute concerted effort to hold that thing off until there's absolutely no more knots available to me. The same thing when I'm flying 182s and 172s and most of the Piper products, um, yeah. including the Saratoga, by the way. Uh, and just, just you just keep coming back, coming back, coming back. The mantra is don't let it touch, don't let it touch, don't let it touch, don't let it touch. And if it touches yep. uh, before that yoke is all the way back at the stops, it's, it's too much. So I would agree to ex an extent with uh, with uh, David David's uh, 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 comment, but I think there's enough exceptions that you can't make it a broad statement. Yeah, and you know, you make an interesting point about the landing thing. I often teach people, depending on the aircraft, it's not true of all aircraft, but I often teach the, the key to making a really good landing is to try very hard not to land. Yes. You know, just get down there and keep working it back in. And of course, I'm on a non-towered field with 5,000 feet of pavement. I'm a big fan of aerodynamic braking because brakes are expensive and I don't really need to use them. It's not so busy. I need to be off the runway right yeah, away. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, that's not true of some really large airplanes. You don't want to do aerodynamic braking. They weren't designed for that. But yeah. here's a comment I really like. John L. who puts up the last transition training he needed was to get into an RV-12 IS. The free cast ring nose wheel was the biggest challenge. Now, not all aircraft have an interconnected nose wheel that work with the rudder pedals, and that's true of the RV-12, a yeah. tremendously popular aircraft that's really becoming common. But that's a great example. If I went from the, the airplane I trained in, which was probably a Part 23 airplane, Cessna or Beechcraft or Piper, and then I go to the RV, it, there's less mass, there's less horsepower, it's not a steerable nose wheel i really have to know how to handle this before i get in it and do the pat brown well let's see how this works method <laughs> yeah the uh, the rvs are a good example of that as are the grummans uh the tiger the cheetah uh, you know the double a one a's all those the, the, the all the grumman products are that way the cirrus products are that way the sr20 and 22 are both that way yeah. um there are a number of lsa's light sport aircraft that are on the market and i'm not talking about the legacy uh, models like uh, Taylor Crafts and J3s and some of the air coupes and whatnot, but 
talking really about more of the European model, some of the some of the uh, Czech, Czech and, and, and Polish models, yeah, those like that, type yeah. of things that that are 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 free castering. Not all of them are that way, but that are free castering those wheels and. And that takes uh, differential braking. And if you're not careful with that, you can you can burn out brakes. And unless you're adept at doing your own brake jobs, which which you can do if you're a certificated pilot, mm -hmm. uh, then um, you're going to spend a whole lot of money on uh, on brakes. You know, you were talking about aerodynamic braking. And I remember um, a, a number of years ago, I was flying with a gentleman at West Houston Airport. If, if some of the folks, if they're uh, familiar with West Houston at all, are familiar with a gentleman named Hank Henry. And Hank was the chief pilot at West Houston Airport for, I don't know, probably 40 or, five, 40 or 45 years. He passed away a couple of years ago at age 94. Now at age 90, he checked me out in a Bonanza, in a, in a, in a Baron, a 58. And he could hardly make it up into the airplane. I thought, I don't know how this is going to work out. But he was a B-24 pilot in World War II, by the way. So um, so it was an honor to fly with him. And I'd flown with him before when I was teaching him how to fly gliders. But, uh, but I'd never flown with him uh, as my flight instructor. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so by the way, he kicked my ass in that airplane. I mean, he, he, he absolutely he couldn't even see over the glare shield and he kicked my ass. But uh, as, we were, as we were landing and touching down, he, t he said something to me. And to this day, uh, I say it as I'm rolling out. And that is... Use the air, his, his point was use the aerodynamic braking, right? Mm -hmm. So he'd say, get that yoke all the way back and put the whoa Nelly on it. So <laughs> get the whoa Nelly like on it. For, 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 for the rest of my life, I will remember, put the whoa Nelly on it. And, and to this day, when I'm teaching uh, or when I'm doing a debrief after a check ride, I'll mention, you know, don't be afraid to put, to use aerodynamic braking on airplanes where it makes sense. And it's most of them. Um, mm -hmm. uh, which will help you slow down some, put the woe Nelly on him. And I'll tell him the, the Hank story. And I just, it's just, you know, it's just, uh, he's, he was just, I miss him terribly. I'll put it that way. You know, I love that stuff. I've heard you talk about Hank before and I, I like it, but you know what? There's people out there who think similarly of you. We've got <laughs> Erdem Burrell here. Hello. I love listening to your podcast. I've got some lessons by Pat Brown. You might remember me, a Turkish glider flight instructor. So Pat, you're a legend in somebody's mind. <laughs> well, I'm I'm flattered and and thank you very much. I do remember you as a matter of fact. That's been a long. It's, that's been a few years though. Yeah, it was fun. Well, as long as we're talking about transition training, and you introduced me to the SR22. We flew your Cirrus when we were out in Houston together. A fantastic airplane. Very very different than the high performance singles I've flown before. But yeah. we've got Marco De Prima saying. What about transitioning from a Cirrus SR22 to a Diamond DA62, a, a powerful twin, single to multi-engine? What are the main concerns? Well, of course, the primary one is, do you have a multi-rating? Because it is a whole different thing. And I don't know about your experience, Pat, but that first time I was in a multi and my instructor shut one down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always an interesting moment, but that first time it was like, talk about whoa, Nelly. Oh, <laughs> this, this is going someplace all on its own. Yeah. There's a whole training program. And I got to admit, I've owned singles. I've owned twins. I would not transition from a single to a twin personally without getting instruction in that aircraft. And that's a personal thing. Um, but I just wouldn't do it. They are different enough and even things like respecting the blue line, which is not something we have in the single world. Man, you get on the wrong side of that and something bad happens, and it's just unrecoverable. Yeah, you know, they, you, some people might remember the, remember the old phrase, Katie, bar the door, because yeah. that's exactly what can happen with a, with a twin. I've, I've got my multi-engine rating. I've got, I've got, I don't know, a few hundred hours in multis, as, as I know you do, Jamie. But I remember my, my brother was an airline pilot and I, and he's, he's younger, but I'm, I'm older, but better looking. Um, of he, he, uh, uh, he, when I got my multi-engine rating many, many years ago, he said, I'm proud of you, big brother. He said, but let me tell you something. If you're, if you're not going to fly them a lot, he said, don't fly them at all. Yeah. And, and, and I went for a while before I, and I got, I got the uh, rating in, I got the, my multi in a, in a uh, travel air. And I got my multi-engine, uh, my, my multi-instructor in an Aztec. 
and I've got some Baron time and I've got some Geronimo time and, and uh, some Apache time and some of that. So I don't have a ton of time in any one twin. So as a result, it, you know, when I get a call to, uh, to transition somebody, let's say, into a Baron, I decline it. And I decline it because I don't have enough time in a Baron to feel like I can safely transition that person. I don't have enough time in any one of those airplanes that I just mentioned to feel mm -hmm. like that I can safely do that. So yes, I'm a multi-engine instructor, uh, on paper qualified to teach multi-engine, but I don't do it because I don't fly multis enough and I don't have enough time in any given airplane. So I would be looking for somebody that had a, I'll say a significant amount of time, and you can define what significant means to you, but a significant mm -hmm. amount of time in a DA-62 DA uh, uh, before I jumped in, in there. Because the other thing is the critical engine. Yeah, I used to own an air cam, an experimental right. twin engine, remember. basically a canoe with a parasol wing. Yeah, probably the easiest twin engine you can fly. I mean, it's just a, a cakewalk. And I, I walked out of the shot there because I wanted to get my uh, my teaching aid here. This is a Boeing Dreamliner, but it's the same basic thing. We've got our engines out on the wings, and if one of them dies, this doesn't just turn like this. It wants to roll over, yes. and you know, as we talk about very often in multi-engine flight school, you lost half your power, but you lost 90% of your performance. Most light twins won't even hold altitude on a single engine. And they don't have to be, yeah, and they don't have to be certified to do that either. And right, so yeah, you can you be know, in a real jam. Very, very quickly. And, you know, you said you say that you lose 90% of your power. And the thing is that you can actually do a mathematical calculation to prove that. That's not just somebody yeah. saying that you don't lose half, you lose 80, it's 80 to 90, depending on the airplane you're flying. Yeah, your, your performance degrades dramatically. So you, you literally may not be able to hold altitude. Yeah. And if you're 50 miles from the nearest airport, this could be an unpleasant day. Now, yeah. nothing against twins. As I said, I owned an air cam and it was terrific. But mm -hmm. my first three hours in that were with factory pilots. Yes. Because I really want to learn the, and that's, it's only a 200 horsepower aircraft. It weighs about what a 150 weighs. It's just got twice the horsepower, big, fat, heavy lift wing, all kinds of fun, but very slow. I mean, it, it yeah. really cruises. Yeah. You, you're pushing it to get to 80. Yeah, yeah mean, there's, there's a, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. There's, there, there's that, that old saying is that that second engine will take you to the side of the crash. Yeah, and, and. This is not to disparage twins. I have friends who own and fly twins regularly. But as you said, if you're not going to fly them a lot, it's probably better not to fly them or only fly them with, a tw with a, an instructor. I knew an instructor many years ago who was telling me the story of somebody he knew owned a Baron, a business mm -hmm. person owned a Baron. And because the CFI was also an airline pilot flying big iron like this, so they must know what they're doing. Right. This guy asked him to come out and give him his flight review. And they're at the hold short line, and the owner and pilot turns to the CFI and says, I'm really looking forward to this, but I don't want you to kill an engine because I don't like doing that. And the CFI was like, well, that's kind of why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the point. Everything else is simple. Yeah. But it really is something that you've got to be up on because should that ever happen, uh, uh, an engine out in a single, unpleasant as it is, and I've had two. I don't, you've had one or two, haven't you, Pat? Yeah. yeah that just had means one you're landing and, here. Yeah. You're, you're going to land here now. You, and you don't have to like that, but you make the best of it. Right. And a, and a twin losing an engine might mean you're about to do some unintentional aerobatics. If yeah, you don't it, get a it, it could. It quick. could. Uh, I've got, uh, not to get too dark here, but just to put a finer point on, on how serious it can be. Uh, I've, I've, I've got a friend that was uh, instructed, was killed in a, in a, uh, uh, doing a VMC demo, um, mm -hmm. you know, in a travel air about four or five years ago. Uh, and it, it took out him and his student. Um, they just, you know, they got yep. too slow and over they went and they couldn't, they couldn't figure, you can't recover from that. Yeah. And a VMC demo is single engine, high pitch, high power. And eventually you lose directional control with the rudder. Problem is if you actually go full rudder deflection and lose it, it's lost. There's no yeah. getting that back. Yeah. And 
that's an unpleasant thing. So anyhow, don't mean to run down on it, but a great reason why transition training is so important. And, and since I've got this super cool model here, you know, even we see pilots from these things and there's glass up there and they're sophisticated and they've got all kinds of things going for them. The person that sits in the left seat of this airplane, even the one that sits in the right, is a talented pilot with a lot of training behind them, thousands of hours, real experience. And if they come out to fly in your Cirrus, they need to learn how to do it because it's <laughs> not the same animal at all. And I love that you're laughing because I've, I've had that experience. I had a really wonderful experience early on in my, my instructing career. I got paired up with a fighter pilot who had just left the Air Force. Yeah. He had been an instructor at the academy. He'd flown F-15s in Okinawa. And I thought, this guy's going to humiliate me. He's going to be just amazing in the airplane. And I'm just this little piston propeller guy. He was awful. I mean, <laughs> just flat out awful. No, He had never flown a piston-powered airplane. Nothing with a propeller. He had no concept of rudders. He had a multi-engine ATP, and he was trying to get a commercial single so he could fly yeah. with his family. Yeah. And I, I still find it entertaining. He would get so frustrated doing chandelles, maximum performance, 180 degree turn, because he would do a beautiful one to the left and then stall going to the right because it's not a mirror image. We're in a turbine. It is. That's right. Yep, that's so exactly right. That, we can often lose sight, and I mean all of us, we can lose sight of the fact yeah. that as we step downhill to less complex, less powerful aircraft, you still need to do transition training because I, I don't think I've ever met a CFI who flew with an airline pilot who didn't have that holy crap moment as they flare at 150 feet. Yeah, that I was actually just about to, to, to say that. I, I, the, the biggest challenge for me as a flight instructor when I was doing some light sport training as a flight instructor was taking the, the pilot, male or female, that mm -hmm. uh, was coming from a from a Bonanza or a Baron or you know some heavy airplane and putting them in an airplane that that you know dripping wet with sweat and full gas is 1320 pounds uh, and because those LSAs yeah. typically accelerate faster than you expect but conversely they decelerate faster than you expect and when you drop the flaps. Uh, on short final, or you're stabilized on short final with full flaps, and you go to round out, you are going to lose some airspeed really, really quickly, generally speaking. And there are some exceptions, but generally speaking. And, and, and if you take it from now, and then let's take it to the other extreme, somebody that maybe has done nothing but flown light sport aircraft and decides that uh, they may want to transition into ultralights, well, now you're talking even a more draggy airplane. And when you pull the power back on an ultralight, you are going to land right there. Yeah. Um, so, um, of course, you can turn it around and say an ultralight to a light sport or a light sport to a heavier airplane. But I think, frankly, that making the, tr the transition in that case uh, is actually a little bit easier than going the other way for, for well, a myriad you know, of reasons. <clears throat> even things like the size of your traffic pattern flying VFR mm -hmm. and a cub, it's going to be very tight into the runway because of all that drag. When you close the throttle, it'll go from 80 to 50 like that. Right now, if I'm in the Cirrus SR 22, I'm, I'm much wider because it just got more inertia. It carries better. If I'm in a caravan, I'm much wider and higher. It's yeah. just a different world. So yeah. that transition training, and I'm really pleased Pat, that the comments coming in tonight are acknowledging Transition training is a necessary thing. Um, yeah. Daffy David's back. You know, the, I used to train airline pilots in 1976 under the GI Bill. They were trying to get their CFIs. Common thing. That, that's not unusual at all. They would flare out in a beach sundowner at 200 feet. Right? <laughs> take over. They are good pilots. They're very good yeah. in this. They're mm -hmm. not very good in that beach sundowner. And that's yeah. what I learned from that Air Force pilot. He was yeah. great in an F-15 or a tweet. He really knew what he was doing. Yeah. I was really good in the Warrior or the 152. Yeah, That's exactly. my domain. And we can all take pride. You could be flying that RB-12, but I'm a really good RB-12 pilot with really yeah. good judgment. I understand the machine. 
I, I think that's maybe what we're heading for, where we all just realize I've flown a lot of airplanes. Pat, you've flown a lot of airplanes, but we never just got in one and said, well, I'll give this a shot. Yeah, we're pretty, never pretty really much. doing that. No, no, that, that, that can be kind of foolhardy. What about going from uh, steam gauges to technically advanced or vice versa? What do you think about that? Oh, man. Well, you know, I've, I've told you this story before, but when I started flying, virtually everything I flew had an ADF in it. And we would listen to Rush Limbaugh or baseball or movies <laughs> from the drive-in on them. But I didn't see glass for the first 20 years of my flight flying career yeah now it's it's in the 152 it's it's kind of unusual now to find a ga aircraft that's really been taken care of that doesn't have glass not only is it a transition to learn how to operate it they're all different yes Zion system is not like the garmin system is not like the name whoever the, you want the avidine system or everything yeah. yeah. I know. You have to learn that box. And, Pat, you were just saying the G1000 has, what, 7,000 buttons on it? 7,021, to be quite honest, to be <laughs> precise. No, it has, uh, It has. I, 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 I counted them one time for a class I was doing on technically advanced aircraft. So the numbers are a little fuzzy, but it's something like six. This is not the perspective in the in the Cirrus, but in the, the just the actual G1000 itself. It has something like 62 buttons. Many of them are multifunction buttons, soft keys. Uh, it has, if I remember right, 24 knobs. Uh, over half of those knobs have an inner and outer knob, and four or five yeah. of those knobs have a push button inner knob. And they all do different things depending on what screen you're looking at. And there's all kinds of, um, all kinds of ways you can get in trouble in, in, a, in a technically advanced airplane that, that it's much more difficult to get in trouble uh, in a steam gauge airplane. One of the things I like about steam gauges, or at least representations of steam gauges, even if it's shown digitally, mm -hmm. is that, for example, in my Comanche, I know when the airspeed indicator is here, I can put the landing gear down. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter what the number is. It's here. Right. I can put the landing gear down. When I'm flying an air, a retractable gear airplane that has a glass panel, I've got to know that it's 150 knots or 130 knots or whatever. I was flying a Malibu the other day and the gear speed on the Malibu, if I remember right, was something like 140 knots, but it had a glass panel. And so now I'm looking, I'm, I'm on the passenger side doing the transition training for this guy in the left seat. And I'm over here looking and watching the speed tape make its, you know, make its, its changes. And okay, now we're at 140 instead of it's right there. Yep. And, and, and so I, I, I do like steam gauges from, from that standpoint, but I'm not a Luddite and my Cirrus has, uh, it has a glass panel and I love it. Mm -hmm. Well, I got to admit, I'm happiest probably in an extremely VFR airplane, the air cam, the cub. I'm just looking out. I'm really not looking at the instrumentation at all. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, I was just mentioning flying the Icon A5. You don't really look at the airspeed indicator. There's an angle of attack indicator, an analog yeah. one. Yeah. And you just fly that wing in there. Yeah. Yeah. But I Mark. will say uh, glass has its place. And, it and does. Whereas, especially in an older aircraft with a shotgun panel where my scan might be this wide. And the glass panel, my scan is this wide. And if I'm in hard IFR, I don't want to be moving my head around. I can see everything right here. And that part's yeah. great. But you're right. The, uh, the indications are very different. We've, well... For those of us of a certain age and vintage, we've got a real knack for looking at instruments and seeing a trend. And as you say, just that needle's there, that needle's there, this needle's here, life is good. Yeah. Whereas you really do have to analyze what you're looking at on a glass display. Yeah. And you I, make a very valid point. You push the wrong multifunction button at the wrong time and you're looking at a whole different page and how do I get back? Now I'm not thinking about flying the airplane it's actually worth sitting down in, in a simulator type of situation, learn the box, mm -hmm. then go fly an airplane with the box in it. But trying to fly the airplane, make good decisions, talk on the radio, and learn a complex piece of equipment, man, that's tough. And, and maybe yeah. not a particularly efficient use of your discretionary income.
<laughs> no, it's 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 really not a, a good way to learn. Trial by fires, you know. I mean, while you know, while the, while the law of learning of intensity, you know, that which scares the crap out of you, you'll remember, is a, is a is a valid law. Uh, is trial by fire in a, in a situation like that, especially if you're trying to do an IFR, is is really uh, not not a good idea. Um, Martin Martin uh, says, I think steam to glass is easier than glass to steam. And I would say you're absolutely right, Martin. In my opinion, you are absolutely right. So, I think that's a very popular opinion. And I have to agree with it myself because at least in steam, we're learning each individual right. unit and what it does specifically and how I can use that. Or can I ignore that? Yeah. Where glass, I have to adapt to each different one. They're somewhat different. And I'm trying to take in all this information at once. You know, in the glass, in the steam gauge, we have the problem in the instrument world of fixation, yeah. where I'm oh, yeah. just looking at the attitude indicator. I'm just looking at the altimeter. That's not necessarily good. With the glass, we run the risk of information overload. It's too much, and I can't process it all. And I'm trying to talk on the radio, and I've got a system failure or a potential system failure, and I'm in IMC. That, that can really build up on you. When you have cert certain glass panels allow you to overlay a tremendous amount of information on the HSI, for example. And I, I don't know about anybody else out there that, that might be fine glass panels, but frankly, the only thing I want on my glass panel on the PFD is the artificial horizon. I'm kind of stuck with the speed tape and, and the altitude tape. Um, mm -hmm. But but uh, on my HSI, all I want is the compass rose and the needle. Um, I can, if I want to, superimpose my magenta line uh, on there or the hold or anything else. But I don't want it there. I want just the stuff that I really need. I've got everything else it can be on my iPad or the MFD, the multifunction display on the right hand side. Uh, I just I just don't want it. There, it's it's too it's too much information, as you said, Jamie. You know, I was doing um, for several years for AOPA. I did the flight instructor refresher clinics, where you'd go out and camp somewhere for a couple of days on a Saturday and a Sunday, and and you'd have 40, 50, 60 CFIs in a room doing uh, uh, doing their their biannual flight instruction of uh, uh, flight instructor refresher clinic, and we would get to the the part about technically advanced aircraft. And there was a statistic um, that uh, that was true several years ago. I don't know that it's true today, but I suspect that it is. And that statistic was that um, um, that glass flying in a glass panel aircraft, generally speaking, is safer than flying in a steam gauge aircraft because of all the backups and redundancies and things like that. However, sure. <clears throat> the accidents. Uh, in, a, in, in, in a technically advanced aircraft, a glass panel aircraft, typically tend to be fatal or more fatal. They're, more of them tend to be fatal than in yeah. steam gauges. And if you stop, you say, well, how can that possibly be? Well, you start, stop and think that, that oftentimes the, the, the glass panel airplanes that we're talking about are uh, newer model bonanzas. All the Cirruses. Um, uh, I mean, more and more airplanes are coming out with glass panel airplanes these days. But typically yeah. speaking, you would think you're you kind of think about the really the higher performance ones, the ones that go high, go fast, and go far, and can and can traverse multiple frontal systems and weather boundaries and things like that in, in a very short period of time. And um, and 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 I and I do think that there is something to the fact that folks look at that kind of equipment and think that they become a superior pilot because they have all this technically advanced equipment on board and they, 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 they let their basic stick and rudder skills atrophy. And I can only tell you from a, from an examiner standpoint, I, I see almost daily when I do an exam in an, with a private or instrument or commercial, any of them with, with a technically advanced aircraft where they learned in it, they, just it, there's something that's missing. I, I can't mm -hmm. put my finger on it, but there's just something that's missing, particularly instruments 
Uh, if you take away the moving map in any particular part of an instrument check ride for somebody to learn to fly on that, if their instructor didn't teach them how to fly without the magenta line, they're absolutely yeah, lost. Yeah, they're lost. And that's, that lost. is that's just it. flat out dangerous. Yep. You know, and Elijah G just jumped in with a really interesting question. It's right up that alley. What about getting an instrument rating in glass versus steam gauges coming from steam gauges during private pilot training? It's an interesting question. It's a yeah. leap because you're going from VFR to IFR. You're going from steam to glass. There's yeah. nothing wrong with doing that. And frankly, I like glass for instrument flying. It, it simplifies my scan. It provides a certain amount of automation. It makes my life easier. And as you say, Pat, I can overlay my hold. I can, If I learn how to use that equipment properly, I can declutter it down to only the basics I need, or I can add all kinds of things. The key is to commit to something and study that. That doesn't mean you can't go back and enjoy VFR on steam gauges, but it probably is worth at some point putting some thought into how would I do this same instrument flight using those steam gauges? Because as you say, it's one of the unfortunate and maybe unforeseen parts of going glass. If you're relying on that magenta line to get you to your destination, if you're relying on that autopilot or any of the other gizmos and gadgets we we can put in our cockpit they can all break they yes, can they all can. overheat the the power source can die something can happen and suddenly you find yourself in less than ideal situation in the air and you don't have that to rely on you have to be able to do it manually and yeah. i do think that's one of the failures of glass is to what you're saying exactly it's not that it's not possible to adapt but sometimes people aren't taught how to adapt. There are backup analog instruments, but yeah, you have to. And, and what these what these applicants have to realize, really, what anybody has to realize is that you know when when I when I sign you off and give you your temporary certificate as an instrument pilot, I'm not saying that you're an instrument pilot in a glass panel only airplane. I'm right. saying you're an instrument rated pilot which means that technically, if you wanted to get out and go fly in a 1965 Cessna 182 that has a coffee grinder radio, uh, and I'm being a bit facetious, but, but, but it's a valid point. Yeah. You are perfectly legal. You're not safe and you're not smart, but you're perfectly legal to go out there and jump in a, in, in a, you know, a Flintstone mobile with coffee grinder radios and an old ADF that's just scratchy and hardly works if you can find an NDB approach somewhere and go fly. Well, I'll so, throw this in there. That is, that, that's a really important thing to consider. I'll throw this in. I, I did some videos earlier today with my buddy Jason Shopper, M0A, and we were talking about there are still airplanes out there, and there will be for many, many years that have a Venturi on the side, not yes, a vacuum pump. Yeah. And there are people who occasionally will take off thinking I'm going to fly into this cloud bank and, and they don't realize that Venturi is going to take a while to develop enough suction to run up those gyros. They're not useful for the first few minutes of the flight. Yeah. So, I actually saw a Facebook post a couple of days ago with a picture of a Venturi. And mm -hmm. what is this? Does anybody know what this is? You would be surprised. Well, you know, you, you know what you're, you know, the kind of answers you're going to get when you post a Facebook thing, you know, because yep. some of them are just, just smart ass answers, but um, you would be surprised at the number. Well, actually, you probably wouldn't be at the number of people that just said, "I don't know." You know, it's a yeah. it's a it's a deer warning horn. You know, or something. Well, that's like that. that that's that transition training thing. If you don't know how your systems work, you're you're not really being a capable, confident PIC. That's so exactly right. It, beyond the horsepower, or amphibious or retractable or seaplane or whatever. Get the training required to know how does that particular airplane work, and you will be much more confident and comfortable, and your passengers will probably be happier flying with you because the last thing they want to do is they see a light flash on the panel or hear a horn, and they say, what's that mean? You go, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Oop, or oops. Or uh oh <laughs> Well, hey, Pat, we've just got a minute left. I really appreciate you doing this tonight. And, and by the way, our, our counterpart, Kay Sundrum, putting in a pool in her living room tonight. Um, she teaches a great course on how to use ForeFlight to its maximum. 
because a lot of us just turn it on and use the moving map. It's, it's got great potential. So get an education in whatever it is you're doing. There's all kinds of resources out there, including ASI or calling up a guy like Pat, who's just a genius. I mean, I learn stuff from him all the time, even, yeah, the, even though hey, we're far apart. Hey, the check, Do you the have check, anything the checks, you I was just going to say the check's in the mail, Jamie. Well, thank you. Just get the right amount of zeros on there this time, okay? <laughs> Hey, we're going to be back in roughly two weeks, and it's going to be an interesting one because I'm going to be right here in the studio. But Pat and Kay are going to be up at this place called Oshkosh, Wisconsin. They're doing some kind of little family gathering there or something. Yeah. Any parting words before we leave the folks tonight, Pat? No, man. I tell you, this is this is this is uh, this is a lot of fun. This is a lot of fun. I appreciate your uh, your time, your effort, your friendship, and all that kind of stuff. I want to thank everybody that joined us. I hope you hope you get something out of these things. Uh, we sure have a. Uh, if you can't tell, we don't like each other very much. So uh, it's 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 a stretch to every two weeks. Oh, I gotta go see Jamie again. But yep. uh, hey, we have a good time. I hope you do too. So. Stay safe and get that transition training. And Marco De Prima, we'll see you in Oshkosh. Absolutely. And folks, come right back here. Just keep watching. In a couple of weeks, we're going to come back. And if you have questions for that episode, as Pat said early on, send them in. Ambassadors, however you spell that with an S, at AOPA.org. Shoot us your question, and we'll deal with it on that special edition of Ask an Ambassador. Until then, have a great Tuesday night. Thank you so much for being with us. Good Take night. Care.